My name is Catherine Arndt and I'm the Chief of the VLGA Connect Studio. I hope you enjoy today's Connect episode brought to you by the VLGA, the national broadcaster on all things local government. Hello and welcome once again to our election series of interviews and today I've got the pleasure of speaking with Councillor Andrea Metcalf, Mayor of Bendigo but also Chair of Regional Cities Victoria. Andrea, welcome. Thank you very much Steve for your welcome. No problem at all. We're really pleased to talk with you because uh, um, there's a lot going on in regional cities and you've got an advocacy program associated with the election and Presumably, whoever wins government, a lot of priorities to talk about. So let's get straight into that. But before we do, can we just talk about Regional Cities Victoria? Um, who are you? Who's in that? And what do you do? So we're the 10 biggest regional cities in Victoria, and we're home to 600,000 people. So Geelong, of course, is the biggest regional city. Uh, Bendigo, Ballarat, and I'll just run through the list now. It's not in terms of size. There's Warrnambool, Latrobe, Shepparton, Horsham, Mildura, Wangaratta, and Wodonga. So that's the ten regional cities. Wow, it's a it's a a diverse mix. Um, you cover the state. You support mm. a range of different sorts of agriculture and industry. That's um it's a big remit. It, it is. It is. That's what we said. We we're right across the state. So. What works in one area doesn't necessarily work in another. So, but we do work very well together. Andrea, before we before we go into the four key um, advocacy areas that you've got, can we talk about what the characteristics are of those cities that perhaps might be really driving the need for investment um, from government now? Yeah. So we know that during COVID lockdowns, that people moved out to the regions. Um, to they were they could have already been um, living here, and but working in Melbourne and commuting, but actually when it came to COVID, it meant that they could work where they lived. But we also had a number of people move out to the regions. And so we know our population increased. Um, there was an increase into the regions higher than an increase in percentage-wise moving into Melbourne. Um, so we do have, um, that happened, it was, if you move from metro to the regions, it was affordable housing at that stage. Um, so there was people that were upgrading their properties that happened. Um, and of course, then of course, put the prices up in the regions as well. Uh, so it's meant that all our regional cities are planning for the future. And we're planning out um, you know, like I'll say here at Bendigo, we're planning out to 2050 with a population of 200,000 people. But we're all planning out going now, what are the things that we have in common? So we know, um, you know, we've got issues around infrastructure that we need to be opened up to make sure that we can provide that housing. Um, but I will say there is a really good opportunity uh, within the in within the com regional cities and it's around the Commonwealth Games because it is about the four sites, uh, but from a regional city's perspective, it's about how the all of the regions and all of the state benefits from having the Commonwealth Games um, in the four lead cities that have got them Geelong, Ballarat, Bendigo and La Trobe. And I know you're all talking, Andrea, about um, not just the uh, the presentation of the Games, I suppose, but the, the livability and the impact um, post the Games um, being yeah. conducted. Absolutely, because uh, we do know already we where the athletes' villages are going to be. We know which sports are where. Not all of the venues have been nailed down, but most of those have been sorted out at this stage. Um, but it's also then, what does it look like from a tourism perspective? Because we know people aren't going to come just out for the games. They'll come out. If you're going to travel from around the other side of the world, you'll be staying a, a bit longer than a week to do the games. You know, it'll be, well, while I'm here, I'll spend two or three weeks and I'll do this and I'll do this. So we want to make sure that um, across the state and across our uh, regional cities that we're all working together for tourism opportunities. Um, I might even come back to that shortly because I, I'm just thinking through your list of members, Andrea, and there are hidden sort of gems in every one of them in terms of things to see and do. Um, can I stay on the um, on the livability um, topic? And and I know that um, 
you know, throughout regional Victoria um, in the regional cities, there's a proud history around education and the, the provision of quality secondary or primary, secondary and indeed mm. um, tertiary education. You've got an advocacy position in relation to that. We do in terms of when we're looking for it from uh, an education perspective. We have universities in our, our regional cities and we know the regional cities are going to need skilled workers. Every All of the regional cities, we, we're all talking about the same thing. It is around housing affordability and it's making sure that we've got workers um, as well, skilled workforce. Um, and it gives us um, regional cities, Victoria, want to work closely with the Victorian Skills Authority to help attract, train and retain the next generation of skilled workers. We also know the opportunities that are going to come with Commonwealth Games around, that'll be one of the legacy items, is around the education of um, our young people into industries that'll give them the opportunity to find work on a, on a longer term basis as well. Yeah, that sustainability becomes... Um... Yeah. Uh, critical, I presume, Andrea. Now, you're going to have these workers, and you just mentioned that word housing uh, very briefly. Um, that seems to be a problem right throughout regional Victoria. So um, what's our position in regard to uh, provision of housing? So we really want the uh, windfall gains tax to be um, reinvested back into housing, in, into infrastructure in particular, and it's the big infrastructure around, I'm going to use the services, sewerage, uh, gas, electricity, uh, digital connectivity. We want to make sure that all of that is, um, you know, the, the investment goes into that because that'll allow us to open up more land to build houses on. So that's where we're saying we, we, we wanted uh, $500 million um, across the 10 cities to put into um, this infrastructure. Um, to then hopefully, you know, it would make it cheaper because the developers are then not paying for it. Um, they, they would then be able to pass those savings on to um, people who are building houses. More, more of that. Now, again, um, the development community will say that uh, planning red tape is the bane of their existence. <laughs> and uh, I know you've been giving some thought to that. Yeah, Look, we hear from that all the time. And one of the things I always say is planning processes are very slow. Um, and we actually want to streamline uh, processes and fast track decisions uh, that will make it easier for land to be able to be opened up. Um, and Regional City Victoria works very closely with Regional Development Victoria to look at opportunities that can benefit the regions in particular. So linking linking some of that that opening up of land to kind of the um, I guess the strategic framework of each of those or the planning framework of each of those councils and yeah. and getting high level alignment. Yeah, that would that is exactly what we need to happen because really you know I, we can go to uh, meetings with our our local um, planning people um, you know and they'll go by the time we st if we want to open up a new tract of land it could be two or three years by the time we get it if it has to be rezoned and then we actually have to put in a planning application then we have to do the subdivision and they go we've got a whole lot of money that's invested mm. up front that we don't have a return on straight away um and it doesn't help that going through the planning process is so slow yeah and it's pretty difficult for the councillors to not be able to commit having not considered the application. So yeah. ways of actually giving certainty earlier sounds like a fine thing. Um, Andrea, in terms of, uh, we'll come to um, to road infrastructure shortly, but just in terms of the livability of regional cities generally, what are the sort of infrastructure priorities and perhaps funding mechanisms that might help us to get there? So we actually um, asked for a $200 million um, infrastructure fund. Um, from the state government as part of our election committee. It was a regional living fund. Um, so, and it allows cities to invest in um, civic community and cultural infrastructure and open spaces. So when you do move to um, the regions, you want to make sure that you've got access, as I said, to libraries, um, to art galleries, to theatres, to open spaces. You know, you want that things that you're normally used to living with. If you live in, in metro areas, you want to make sure you've still got access to those things as well. So we want the um, a two hundred million dollar regional living fund to allow us to make that um, um, investment. To really presume, presumably, ensure that there is absolute quality of life for yep um, for your communities. Um, yeah. 
Now, talk about Bendigo in particular, because I happened to be in a conversation a week or so ago with one of your citizens. I was quite gobsmacked, Andrea, by some of the names of the corporates who've who have located to like multinational corporate to have located in Bendigo. And I presume all of the regional cities um, could lay similar claim. What's, um, what are the needs with business attraction? Because you're doing pretty well at the moment. Yeah. So here at Bendigo, ours is really around um, industrial land because we have um, our manufacturers saying we need more land. So this council's actually got taken the position of purchasing land um, to be able to set up an industrial park. Uh, we're now working with the Victorian Planning Authority to get that going through because it's got to be rezoned and to make sure that then we can get services out to there. So we're working with the state government on that. Um, and then we know already that there are businesses that are saying we will move out there as soon as that is available. So is that about increasing the scale of existing businesses or sort of strengthening the local supply chains or is there a bit of both? Well, well it's um, increasing the scale of existing businesses, but it then gives new businesses the opportunity to move out um, to the regions as well. So uh, th I think we think that that's a great um, way to be able to do it. Uh, from us from a business perspective and um, look it was only just recently that um, Councillor Margot Rourke and I were out with a, a local business and they what they do and it's um, and I'm going to say in that software ele electronic um, business and um, they actually 99% um, of what they make goes overseas so it's just you know it, it's just I would have said just an average sort of a building yep and there's all this work happening in it. And it's just amazing what they do. And we have, our manufacturing industry is really strong. And I would say before I came on council, people would say, oh, you know, manufacturing is dead in, in, you know, in Bendigo. And I'm sure the other regional cities hear it as well. And it is just so far from the truth. Our manufacturing industries are doing really well. Yeah. And you, what I've heard you say is there's a national interest in terms of the export payback. Yes, yeah, exactly right. So it's it is just um, you know, we have we want um new businesses to come to Bendigo as do all the regional cities because we know it provides job. And when we talk about jobs, you know, we also wanted that, you know, guaranteed spend from the state government into regional areas uh of 20% of, of the total budget into regional areas that we could um audit each year to make sure that we did get it but it, go, it gives some certainty around yeah. um, being able for businesses or you know new industries to set up and go well we know we're going to get this work from the state government because they're going to be here and they're going to be investing so it gives that certainty around jobs. It would have to be preferable Andrea to wait into the year before an election for all the announcements that we sort of seem to get. <laughs> I know, I know. Hey, what about what about we keep going though? Because yep. you've been on a roll on jobs, and you touched on it before. Uh, the place of regional tourism. Oh, I mean, look, regional yeah. tourism really suffered during COVID. I will say, and like we could move around a little bit in our state, in the regions. Um, not like the uh, bring of steel around Melbourne and the five kilometres from home, yeah. but it was the fact that we our borders were shut like not only international borders, but within this Australia, our borders were shut. Um, and so we know that tourism is rebounding, but they don't have the staffing. The staffing did, numbers didn't come back that were previously involved in the tourism. And Steve, I'll just give you an example because we were extremely lucky this year that our art gallery had the Elvis Direct from Graceland yes. exhibition. We've just been advised that, and we're allowed to talk about it, um, it generated $67 million into our local economy and another $22 million across the state. So it's just, you know that tourists want to want to come, you know that people want to get out and about now, um, but it, all of our hospitality industries, and this is right across all of our regional cities, they're all saying we need staff. Yeah, and I've got a confession to make. Um, Andrea, I've only been to the galleries at Latrobe, Shepparton, and Bendigo, Geelong, and Ballarat, so still got five to go. You and have got five to go out there. Yeah, yeah. And I'll just, I will just throw in, um, like you know, we're uh, UNESCO um, Creative City of Gastronomy, 
but also, and I'll just say in our area, we've got 13 local governments that are doing a World Heritage bid for the goldfields. And we could end up being, because there's not too many places that would be a World Heritage site plus a UNESCO site. Ballarat's got a UNESCO um, designation as well, as, as has Geelong. So there's opportunities, even from a UNESCO perspective, coming up with the Commonwealth Games. So what do you need from government in terms of tourism, Andrea? Oh, we'd actually like to see, uh, to keep our experiences world class, but we need an investment in tourism to help businesses train and retain staff and operate at 100% capacity because that's not what we're seeing at the moment. And we're coming into peak season, um, you know, and I'm sure uh, down on the coast, they would say they're coming into their peak season as well. Uh, when we also might need to employ seasonal workers. So there's a whole lot of links here, Andrew. I'm seeing, you know, we're talking about jobs, but it comes back to livable communities and there's got to be housing for them to, to live. So there's none of these can just be picked out and um, treated in isolation. And on a similar theme then, that people have got to get around. So transport um, connectivity, uh, what's the position of regional cities, Victoria, there? Look, we're really pleased to see the announcements that have come up out from both parties already around reductions in, I'm going to say, train fares, um, you know, to, to, to travel. Um, but, of course, there isn't too much connectivity between the um, regions itself. So, you know, we can all get to Melbourne. That's not the issue. It's how do we get to, from Bendigo to Ballarat or Bendigo to Geelong, you know, and being able to do it by public transport. Um, if we talked about um, connectivity, we'd be talking about um, there's actually 19,000 kilometres of arterial and free, arterial roads and freeways in regional Victoria, and that's out of 23,000 kilometres across the whole of Victoria. So um, it's you know we we need big investments into our roads as well. Um, but as I said, there isn't that interconnection between the um, regional cities and even like our, our smaller councils as well. And that's probably something that we will need to look at as part of Commonwealth Games as well, because, you know, we could say 10 cities in 10 days, you know, as a slogan, yes. and it won't be quite like that. But we need to make sure that we've actually, if you're going to be here um, at Bendigo, would you go over to Ballarat and you'd be doing something else? And then would you go down to Geelong and... Would you go to Warrnambool? You know, it's got to be easy to get to those places. And there is just isn't that connection by public transport at the moment. So we'd need to see um, a greater, greater investment in that space. So the Commonwealth Games might provide a sort of litmus yes. test for a transport network that's sustainable into the future. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. What about digital connectivity, Andrea? Mm. So yes, it's um it's an issue for us in the region, and it, and there's certainly been announcements from the federal government around that as well. But if I give you the example of Commonwealth Games, if we could imagine having a couple of hundred thousand people extra in our cities at different times, all trying to use the same network, um, you know, it's it's not going to work if you've got three bars on your phone to be able to send out. You know, when people are used to having a a, a much quicker um, service. So there'll be a fair bit of work that needs to happen in that space as well. So a bit of redundancy built in to, to be able to cope with that number. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And again, that would be a legacy because if it could be, and they might just put out, you know, stands here and there, you know, um, on a temporary basis, but if it could be built in as a permanent thing, it would be great. Andrea, sustainability is an ongoing theme. Mm -hmm. um, where are regional cities at in terms of basically environmental sustainability generally? So, um, and I will just drop this into Com Games again, just in terms of what the fact that when we talk about sustainability, we're talking about um, uh, buses that are electric across all of the regional cities. We're talking about uh, tree planting for every child. Um, or every person in the state as part of the Com Games to help make them, we say carbon positive. Birmingham did carbon neutral. We want to go one better and be carbon positive. So that's the conversation that we're having. But we all know, we only have to look at what's been happening over the last few years, that we all have to work together to find a solution um, to fight climate change. 
and we want to ensure that any infrastructure that we do is sustainable and it is directed to regional projects and it is about making sure and we'll talk about waste in a minute but actually reusing those resources that would otherwise go to landfill putting them into projects um, so that we're not using raw products as well so we've got to get smarter about that part of it so I'm hearing a real investment in circular economy yes. and sort of foresight in the way that we're making these decisions. Now you touched on um, you touched on the on the waste and refuse topic, Andrea. So we actually think uh, it's a huge opportunity for councils uh, managing uh, waste and realising the potential of the circular economy. Bendigo is doing quite well on that. I know Ballarat is as well. Um, there's a, a great part of the responsibility uh, lies with us to manage waste because we're the service that, you know, picks it up every week. Um, at the moment, you know, um, it is, you know, some councils will start to move towards a fortnightly pickup of garbage and maybe weekly organics. You know, there'll be some thoughts around that. Um, but there's a lot of money that's gone into uh, the landfill levy. Uh, it's revenue that's going out of uh, the councils and we think it should be reinvested in waste processing and upcycling facilities and that these could um, happen in regional areas, which would, would also bring jobs to regional areas as well. Um, I know at Bendigo we might say that of all the money that we've put into um, the landfill level, we've got about a 3% return on it. So, you know, And it's not a 3% return. I presume you're saying you've got 3% of it back. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. So we think that there's opportunities, though, um, in regional areas to do some of this circular economy work. And as I said, I do know there's areas that are working on that you know, across our across our regions, and some of them are more advanced than others. But yeah, it's just work that we still need to do, and we need investment to be able to do to do it. So, is the message um, in regards to the landfill levy that it just it, a good start would be that it be unlocked? Yes, that would be fantastic. I think I don't think it'd just be regional cities that would say that. <laughs> I think you'll find some kindred spirits. Um, I think we will, Andrea and. On the flip side, um, just a bit of a side issue. Um, the floods recently um, have affected certainly a couple of your member councils. Mm. Um, any sort of messaging in terms of uh, the impacts um, of floods on, on your member councils? So um, I have been in touch with, uh, with the mayors of Shepparton and at Mildura. So Mildura are still waiting for the peak to hit. And initially they thought the peak would hit in the middle of the month and it's now saying it's this coming weekend. Um, there's an aw awful lot of water laying around um, in paddocks um, as we head up north. Um, but Mildura wants to make sure that any packages uh, must be easily accessible. Uh, they want information on um, flood funding and recovery for both council and businesses and businesses will come and talk to councils. So come and we need that information up front. Um, Shepparton are in recovery mode and the floods for them have exposed some infrastructure that they think is quite dated. And they would really, again, highlights the importance of their bypass to them. Now, that's been an election commitment as well. Um, so uh, we'd like to see those things happening. So I'm hearing you say that... Um member councils would like clarity over what's available they want easy access to funding I think um, you sound as though your kindred spirits with the rural councils in terms of building back better um, in yes. regard to infrastructure and the fact that what it's identified is some real pressing infrastructure priorities that perhaps could be fast-tracked and that building back better is a key part and I'll just say when I do uh, do a lot in uh, Campaspe councils and, you know, we had also Hepburn Council um, are going to build back the same path three times in 18 months. And you go, why couldn't we build it back better the first time instead of having to build it three times in 18 months? So that's a, a real push. And that's certainly from a yeah. regional city's perspective and, as well. And and I, and I know what you said. That's not a criticism of that council. It's a no, not. of the nature of the funding at the moment. Yes, that's exactly right, because they could only put back what they had in the first place, which if, if it's a gravel path and you suddenly get another flood go through, you've lost your path again. Whereas if they'd actually been able to put in, I'll say, a concrete path, 
uh, and even reuse and even using uh, recycled materials in you know in footpaths, it would have helped, yeah, and so, they wouldn't be having to rebuild it again. So we're back to we're back to some of your recurring themes around um, yeah the the circular economy, the opportunity for more livable places, um, and and the package generally. Um, Andrea, just to close out, um, if anyone's in any doubt. Um, perhaps in Spring Street, what is the elevator pitch for investment in um, in uh, regional cities? So we actually did put through an election prospectus, but for me it boiled down to there were three things. It was around housing, it was around jobs, and the third bit was around um, the reason for living in the regions, and they're great places to live in. They sure are. Andrew, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Steve. Really appreciate your time. Great. Thank you.